Uh, so, so what is this mumblecore thing? Oh boy. <laughs> I don't know, Susan and I were sort of right there at the start of whatever it is, at least at the naming of it, which happened at South by Southwest in 2005 when Four Eyed Monsters was there and when our film Kissing on the Mouth was there. And Puffy Chair. And the Puffy Chair and Mutual Appreciation. Right. And these four movies were all made by people of roughly the same age, were made by real couples, playing couples, in the movie. None of them were really traditional kind of narrative movies. They all really focused a lot more on the characters and on the relationships and on a level of naturalism and sort of using documentary film techniques because none of us knew each other. Right. Yeah, we, we were all like, movies. whoa. Hey. We got it when we yeah. when we saw your like blurb about kissing yeah. on the mouth, we yeah. were like, oh no, someone made the same movie as us. <laughs> <laughs> and then we saw it and we were like, okay, it's distinctly yeah. different. All four like, you know, really. yeah. All four, that's yeah. that is what's really That's weird, that so. simultaneous invention. Yeah, exactly. That so in all actually. in different parts of the country, yeah. all, you know, uh, all of us sort of had made similar works, but then when when all four were put right next to each other were, were really different. Yeah. But there were enough similarities that, that between us and also the, the press at the festival, people just sort of started talking about, well, what's going on? How come all of a sudden there's these four movies and who are these people? And they were joking about what should we call these four movies, right? What, what, like, what's the genre? On this film Mutual Appreciation, the guy who did the sound was always having trouble understanding the lead actor because he was claiming that he mumbled all the time. <laughs> And then, so that sound guy said mumblecore as a sort of a reference to music, like hardcore yeah. or something like that. Nobody really liked it. Everybody thought it was a stupid name. Yeah, nobody wanted to be called mumblecore. Nobody wanted to be called <laughs> mumblecore. But we were happy to get the press. And it never, it just never went away. Is mumblecore an, a, a movement or is it, did it come out of the type of basically making films with no money and sure telling the stories that you want to tell. Yeah. I think it's more of a movement because I think that we didn't tell the films that we told because for no budget, like in a sense, well, this is all we can do. We have no budget, so this is all <laughs> well, we can Well, you can't do. make Ben-Hur. Right, but, but, okay, I, think, so but I think what was interesting is like, Aaron and I specifically had something we wanted to discuss in the film. And that was kind of like, what it's like to be lonely in a city and to be a creative and to not know what you're doing. And then to find somebody that brings out everything in you that you've always wanted to have unleashed, at least even if it's only momentary. You know, it's something that can be shot like on no budget because it's real, mm -hmm. you know? And depicting something that's real is I think it's something that we've all tried to do. Uh -huh. And I think because mm -hmm. that's what we want to communicate versus because we don't have any money. And I think also a lot has to do with the fact that we were, we acted in it and we're all untrained actors. But and why did you just... act in it? Because you had to? Not that we yeah. had to, had to, but also for, I mean, for Kissing on the Mouth, it was just a level of comfort and intimacy between us because we knew there would be sex scenes and things like that. It was easier for us to act in it because there was basically four of us making the whole movie. Because we knew each other, we could get to the place we wanted to get much quicker than if we had cast actors and had to work with them for six months to sort of to get that trust. You know, the thing is yeah, like actors well. are really easy to get. You know, I mean, there's so many actors and a lot of them are really good and all of them would just be so happy to be in something and like even if you just feed them that we definitely could have gotten actors if we wanted them. That's all you got to do is feed them? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> eventually they're going to want more, but you know, when you're just starting out it's yeah. like okay. I mean, but really, I mean, I think for us too it was that we thought that the only people that could portray the story was us because it was about us. And then in Puffy Chair and stuff like that, I mean, they are actors. Yeah, they are actors. You know, so mm -hmm. of course they're They gonna... are actors. <laughs> so you don't consider yourself actors? I, I, well, Apparently not. No, no, I don't. I mean, I would and never it, think of myself as one. But are, have you been in everything you've done? I have not been in everything I've done, but, I've, but most, of my, most of my acting yeah. has been in my own films. And then I've, I've been in Friends films outside of that. I've never... Um, auditioned for a part yeah, right. that wasn't a Friends right. movie. You know? Yes, you kind of have Hollywood, and then you kind of have the. There's this sort of fake independent film community. I call it the fake independent film community, which is Hollywood. Yeah, they're big Hollywood pictures. They're studio. Movies. Yeah, they're yeah. studio movies, but they're cl they're they're saying, oh, we're an independent movie because right. it gives them some. A movie is not really publicity. Yeah. An independent movie's got a little more publicity. Right. It sounds like, oh wow, these people scraped this thing out of their basement, right. you know. But those are Hollywood pictures. So we got Hollywood, we got the independent film community, and what we would call maybe the micro film community yeah. or the mumblecore community yeah. or something. DIY. 
Yeah, that's yeah, kind of a new word that people are starting to use. Yeah. It's DIY? Yeah. Yeah, do it yeah, yourself. Do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, because I think I don't like that. <laughs> well, I don't that do you like, like mumblecore though? I like that better. At least it's <laughs> like French New Wave yeah. dogma mumblecore, but DI. It sounds like you're building a workshop. But there. honestly, with like mumblecore, I think the reason Furniture. that we've all been reticent to coin the term yeah. is because we don't want anyone saying it's a genre and then people getting interested in making films in that genre. Because yeah. we all made. Well, I think that's already happened. Right, but yeah, we no, all made those films because we were like we were excited to make them, and I think all of us would hope that other young filmmakers would make something that they're passionate about not something that they fit would fulfill a genre. This is how I see that. Okay, so you've seen uh, The Graduate. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so The Graduate kind of speaks to that generation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you had this movie Reality Bites, mm -hmm. which kind of right. spoke to that generation. It, yeah. it did. It did at the time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And now you have these movies that you're making that really kind of speak to your generation. Well, to the like small, three. yeah. Maybe, I mean, yeah. Small. To the three of you <laughs> in your generation. Know, yeah. It's hard to tell whether the movies are speaking to the generation. I think they do. I've been, a f I've been very cautious uh, with, in regards to that because you know, I'm not making them about the generation. Each movie I'm only making about the couple characters that are in it. And I, obviously I hope that they have a much but wider But you are the generation. Yeah, That's what you're not yeah, getting. Yeah. Your yeah, directing yeah. style, the way you're writing the stories, the way you're the way you talked about that love story that you had, that's what we're talking about. We're not but I'm a small about... part of it because there's, I mean, just within our generation, there's still just as many people as are making small DV movies now, there are still just as many people our age making things on 35 millimeter and, and wanting to make there Hollywood are? films. Well, uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, but they're not doing it. Some are doing a it. A couple. Yeah, but, but it's just e it's cheaper and more affordable to do what we're doing, which is why more people are doing it. See, the yeah. stupid part about Hollywood to me is the movies that speak to a generation, those are the ones that are going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why they're <laughs> and not. And you're saying our films are speaking to a generation? Yeah. When are they going to start making a lot well, of money? Well, you don't have, you, the, 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 the issue is, is the marketing of it. Hollywood has always decided what people will watch. Yeah. The web now gives people an opportunity to say, wait a minute. I'm going to decide what I watch. You know, you say The Graduate is my generation. I say no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I watch this. Yeah. Personally, I think Hollywood's making a big mistake. I think they should be getting behind pictures like yours and releasing them. Any of your pictures would do amazing. If they put their kind of bucks behind it and they plunked it in 2,500 theaters mm -hmm. and they let it sit there for a while and they marketed it to people and said, this is what you're supposed to watch. They will watch it. Mm. I agree to a degree that all of our films would do a lot better if we had bigger marketing budgets. No, you need the Hollywood machine. It's yeah. more than yeah. that. It's I mean, the marketing. Yeah. And it's, it's everything. Because to some degree, like I know that the internet does give a lot of access, but it doesn't give the discoverability is still kind of an issue. Like I feel like yeah. you've created a niche, like you know, Fred Monsters created a niche. I feel like all of us have really worked really hard for the audience that we have. But we all, you know, we still have our, you know, day jobs. I don't know what audience I have. I mean, it's still very invisible to me in a lot of ways. I mean, as far, the only audience I know that I have is my cl close circle of friends. No, right. no, no, look, I, I know people are buying audience. the movies, but, but I don't know who they are. It's not. Well, they're not over 40. They might be, though. I, they're me, but then I'm the only one over 40. But I, I wouldn't, I don't know, because I think that the movies have, there's some sort of, documentary ethnographic quality to them that's Absolutely. interesting to people outside, more interesting almost to they people outside be, but, of our generation. Especially, I remember the Q&As for LOL. LOL people, especially. People yeah. were, it was like a, yeah, it was like a cultural study. They were like, <laughs> it was like they were. People our age were bored by the movie because they said we live it every day. Well, well then you're not speaking to your generation. Yeah, yeah, Get back and figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, you need to, okay, well, okay, well step one is that's, that's a big problem right there because the very first thing you got to know is who you're making your film for. So you need to figure that out. Yeah, but when that's when, not what that's we do. About that's what's different. That we're making them for ourselves, and then they're, they're finding an audience right, later. Okay, so different. let's talk about that. At what point does marketing now change art into something that's marketable? Like, look at Da Vinci. He worked under commissions. Yeah. Michelangelo worked under commissions. Yeah. Yen said something about Andy Warhol. In other words, can you, can you make your art, and, and can that be a sustainable revenue source where you're not doing commissions. Right. I'm getting the idea that both of you on your first pictures were just like, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do and I make the art exactly the way I want it. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so you two are the first artists in the history of man. Even, no, even when <laughs> we are. were making Kissing on the Mouth, we weren't thinking at all about, oh, what film festival should we submit to? Right. Or anything like that. I mean, getting into South by Southwest was really a, a surprise. We didn't really go through the, the being, right channels. And That being said, though, as a filmmaker, you're always, as you're editing something, thinking... Does, is this going to make sense to a cold viewer? Is this going to make sense to a okay, cold viewer? Okay, that's marketing yeah. now. Now you know you're getting I mean? into marketing. But I don't, right. but like, I don't <laughs> think, like, is it going to make sense to a 50-year-old? Is it going to make sense to, like, an African-American? Like, I just think, yeah, but you is are, this story going to make no, sense? No, but, you're, you're, but you're, that's part of the art. Yourself, in all of the films, yeah. yeah. In all of the films, I'm viewer. making it for an audience. I'm not, if I was making it for myself, I just would never show it to anybody. I'm making it for an audience, but the decisions that I'm making aren't based on focus groups or test screenings or things like that. They're very much based on whether or it's Or any work. kind okay, of established formula, yeah, you know, like Hollywood yeah. operates. No, no, that's a good point. So in other words, when you're done, like, uh, uh, there, there's a film that we're actually, that I was an executive producer on, and we're actually going to, like, have a focus group uh -huh. to decide. Because I look at it, I say, I think it's way too long. Yeah. It's just, it's like, painfully long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then the, the director's like, well, that's exactly how I want it to be. I'm uh -huh. like, um, all right, well, you know what I mean? <laughs> but... But you do some kind of focus group. You look at it, I you drop it on your friends. I have, yeah. exactly. But look at, like, yeah. this just happened with them, is that Chris had done an editor of her film, and now she's going through it with Joe, yeah. and, like, they're cutting, they're cutting things, and, like, yeah. and it's, it's things that you liked, group. but they yeah. make the film stronger, because yeah. right. eventually you want the film to be Well, you get so people. close to it. I mean, that, yeah, yeah, we just went through this last night. We were, like, sitting down and going, combing through my, my film, and, and I, would, I would have to change perceptions I would go like no I love that scene I love that scene and Joe was like we should cut it shorter and then five minutes later I was like fuck we should cut it shorter <laughs> yeah. yeah you know and like when we did when we showed Fred Monsters at uh, all the festivals the two like the slam dance screening is vastly different from like what is now on the DVD like so different like mm -hmm. every audience we screened it with was a test audience and every festival or screening that we did we changed the edit until oh, okay. finally we arrived at the final edit so for sure we care about how people are reading it because I think the point of making stuff is that it needs to communicate and if you fail to communicate then you have failed as an artist right. mm. and so it is important how it's perceived now, is it important, like if somebody just says, I hate Mumblecore, I hate this, like are you going to then say, I give up, I'm gonna make like vampire movies, like from now on, like horror films, because that's right. what communicates. No, right. yeah. but you want your film to be the strongest it can be for the people that should wanna see it. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's really well put, actually.